In the second part of this unit, we're going to have a brief look at the history of deep learning together. Deep learning has been developed in three waves. This is typically what people identify as three different waves. And the term deep learning didn't exist when um, these ideas started to grow. So the first wave was the wave of cybernetics, where deep learning was called cybernetics. It was also called the golden age, with a, a lot of great discoveries and following great hopes. At that time, people were using simple computational models of the brain, simple computational models of biological learning to imitate biological learning and to learn simple rules which were shown successful for classifying simple patterns. However, um, people realized at some point that these simple models were not powerful enough in order to solve more complex tasks, which led to a decline in research. In the 1980s um, to uh, the 2000s, deep learning has often been called or been associated with connectionism. In connectionism, it was assumed that intelligent behavior was realized through a large number of very simple units, very simple computational cells. And it was also in that age where very important developments such as backpropagation or um, sequence models have been developed. However, this um, development was in the shadows. It was overshadowed by other developments. So this is why it's called the Dark Age. The reason why it was overshadowed was that while these algorithms were working on very simple examples, big breakthroughs on complicated, very challenging um, real world examples, as for instance, the field of computer vision was looking at, couldn't be demonstrated with these models due to a lack of a lack of algorithms, a lack of compute and a lack of data mainly. And then finally, from 2006 to now, um, deep learning was actually called deep learning. And I would call this the revolution age, where people demonstrated that with deeper networks, larger data sets and more compute, deep learning was leading to state-of-the-art results, dominating almost all leaderboards across different fields and disciplines. Well, let's go back. Let's go back all the way to 1940. In 1943, McCulloch and Pitts, here on the image um, on the right, this is McCulloch, on the left is Pitts, um, developed an early computational model for neural activation. Here on the left, you can see what this model looked like. It's called a linear threshold uh, unit or neuron. It's called linear threshold neuron because it's a threshold. It's a threshold on a linear computation. Here, X is the data and W are some weights. X could also be some features of the data. So let's just call that features from now. Now, if you multiply these features with the weights and this product is bigger than zero, we assign plus one to that function. If it's smaller than zero, we assign minus one. That's a binary decision. That's why it's called a linear threshold neuron. It has been demonstrated that this simple operation is more powerful than simple AND OR gates and OR gates are special cases of this computation. But at the time, there was no procedure to effectively learn the weights. This has changed in 1958, where Rosenblatt 
developed the famous perceptron, which was an algorithm, but also an impl implementation, an actual hardware implementation of this algorithm to train these single linear threshold neurons. And it was done using a uh, what's called the perceptron algorithm, which was optimizing the perceptron criterion shown here. This is very different from what we do today using gradient-based optimization with backpropagation, because the linear threshold unit here is uh, non-differentiable due to this threshold. Right? So it cannot be learned with gradient-based optimization. So that's why this auxiliary uh, task here has been defined, which is simply saying, well, I'm looking at all the um, results that have been wrongly labeled. So M is the set of wrongly labeled examples. I'm looking what the model does for those. And I'm looking at the true label, which is plus one or minus one, and I'm minimizing a loss based on these incorrectly classified labels such that they are um, hopefully in the next iteration of the algorithm correctly classified. This is what optimization of this criterion does. And it is indeed for this very simple model, an optimal thing to do. It's not guaranteed to converge in, in the smallest number of iterations to the solution, but it has been proven to converge to the right solution if a solution exists. So if these, uh, given these features, the classes, these two classes here, it's a binary model, are actual, actually separable. This was a big success and uh, made it to the media. So I want to show you a little video demonstration of this. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. As you have already heard in the video, um, while uh, providing a working example of uh, such a um, algorithm for training the weights of a single linear threshold neuron, it was heavily overhyped. For instance, Rosenblatt claimed that the perceptron will lead to computers that walk, talk, see, write, reproduce themselves and are conscious of their own existence. Um, so the hopes and expectations were really high. Um, and if uh, as soon as people saw that these couldn't be fulfilled, um, this led to a tremendous uh, mistrust in this technology. Um, in addition, in 1969, Minsky and uh, Poppert published a book called Perceptrons, which mathematically showed several discouraging results for this simple model. For example, it showed that a single layer perceptrons cannot solve some very simple problems such as the XOR problem or counting. Subsequently, this led to 
less and less interest and less and less funding in this area and uh, also led to the rise of symbolic AI, um, which dominated in the 70s. In uh, 1979, um, Fukushima proposed the neocognitron, which was one of the predecessors of, of models. It's actually quite similar to the convolutional neural network, network models that we're still using heavily today and which are amongst the most successful models, um, in particular in computer vision. Um, here on the right, this is not Fukushima, what you can see here, whom you can see here, these are Hubel and Wiesel. Um, and I show them here because this uh, Fukushima's neocognitron was heavily inspired by Hubel and Wiesel's experiments in the 1950s. In the 1950s, Hubel and Wiesel studied the visual cortex, the V1 areas in cats. And they found um, that there's different types of neural cells in this visual cortex. There are cells that are sensitive to the orientation of edges. Um, and there are cells that are insensitive to the exact position. They call these cells simple and complex cells. This was a great discovery and it was recognized with the Nobel Prize in 1981. And I want to show you a brief video of uh, Hubel and Wiesel. The researchers actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing in the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen and we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector which swept a line a very faint precise narrow line across the retina and every time we did that we'd get a response so i'm showing you this video not only because of the great discovery of Hubel and Wiesel, because, but because also it is a very ins instructional video of how research actually works, in particular in uh, computer science and deep learning. A lot of the discoveries that we do are actually um, didn't didn't went out as expected. Right? So we we are often not setting the experiments up for what we are discovering in the end. But it requires a lot of hard work, it requires a lot of experimentation until something is discovered that actually leads to a breakthrough, such as in this case, where the experiments were not working very well in the beginning, but by accident they found that this little thin edge um, at the edge of this overlay was actually causing the neurons to spike. So you, as the next generation of researchers, um, uh, can be highly uh, uh, inspired and motivated by, by this. So back to Fukushima's neocognitron. Um, Fukushima, as already mentioned, was, was heavily inspired by these discoveries of Hubel and Wiesel. And they proposed a computational model that mimics these um, simple and complex cells that Hubel and Wiesel found. So they proposed this multi-layer pr processing uh, network here for creating intelligent behavior, which is composed of simple S and complex C cells. And those basically implement what we know as convolution and pooling, the two most fundamental operations in deep neural networks today. However, there was no backpropagation algorithm at the time. So this learning happened using reinforcement 
based learning rules. Um, however, the model architecture was a heavy inspiration for, for what is uh, very successful today, just using a different type of optimization algorithms. In 1986, um, the backpropagation algorithm was reinvented, one has to say. It was known already since 1961, but the first empirical success really was demonstrated in 1986 by Rummelhart, Hinton and Williams. The backpropagation algorithm is still the main workhorse of deep learning research today, even after all these years. It's unthinkable at the moment to do deep learning without the backpropagation algorithm. And the reason for this is that it allows the efficient calculation of gradients in a deep neural network with respect to the network weights. These deep neural networks, they have a huge amount of parameters, millions or even billions of parameters. So it's really important that in every iteration of the learning algorithm, um, we can very efficiently compute the updates to these weights. And this is what this algorithm provides. It enables the application of gradient-based learning to deep networks. And this was, this was a, a major breakthrough at the time. In 1997, um, Schmidhuber and Hochreiter proposed what is now famously called long short term memory. Actually, already in 1991, Hochreiter, in his diploma thesis, demonstrated the problem of vanishing and exploding gradients, which is particularly severe for sequence modeling tasks, where you have um, uh, variables over very long periods of time, like text, where you have long text sequences that you want to model and uh, where you need to backpropagate through all these steps and where it's very easy for the algorithm to ever, you know, uh, where, the, where it's very easy for these gradients to ever completely vanish so that the algorithm doesn't learn anymore or to explode such that you, you don't end up with useful results. And as a, as a, as a solution to this problem for sequence modeling, the long short term memory has been proposed, which uses a combination of, of feedback loops and forget or keep gates to effectively bridge this gradient flow over very long time horizons. Basically keep information, store information efficiently over very long time horizons. And this has really revolutionized uh, natural language processing. Um, but only very lately, has been actually um, gotten this peak in, 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 in recognition and also in citations, as you can see here. The algorithm was, was not very well known for, for decades, but then from roughly 2014, 2015 on, when it, when, when it was demonstrated that this is really working very well if you have a large data sets and large computers. Um, uh, you can see this this growth in citations. This is the citation numbers of this paper. And in from 2015 on, it has been used also. Uh, it has completely replaced the machine translation and, and language recognition technology at, at major tech companies such as Google's. So LSTM was a fundamental piece of making language processing at Google significantly better than it was before. In 1998, um, Jan Lecun proposed uh, the convolutional neural networks, which, as already mentioned, is similar to the neocognitron, but trained end-to-end -end using the backpropagation algorithm. It implements spatial invariance via convolutions and max pooling, and using, uses this weight-sharing idea to reduce the parameter space. So the real new thing about this paper was that now it was demonstrated for the first time that these convolutional networks, which have been existing before, could be trained very effectively using the backpropagation algorithm and led to very good results on 
a standard machine learning task, which we'll also look at in this lecture, which is this MNIST um, digit classification task. However, at the time, the results didn't scale up yet to the complexity of, um, of uh, computer vision problems that people were interested at the time. And this was uh, the reason why convolutional neural networks uh, became only became really popular from roughly 2006, 2010 on. Then another uh, like really major breakthrough was then finally the demonstration of um, AlexNet on ImageNet. ImageNet is a, is a huge data set and a benchmark called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge which features 10 million annotated images and each image is annotated with one uh, out of 10, uh, one, uh, one out of 1000 categories. For instance, a particular type of dog or a chair or a spoon, etc. So this was um, where for the first time such huge amount of data became available. And then uh, Hinton uh, in Toronto and his team demonstrated that uh, with a few tricks, tweaking these basic convolutional neural networks, they called it AlexNet, um, were able to win this, uh, this very uh, important benchmark in the computer vision uh, community. And this was, a, this was a real breakthrough. This was an eye opener for the computer vision researchers because they saw for the first time, well, this deep learning technology does not only work for this very simplistic digit recognition task with like this 28 by 28 pixel digits, but it really also works for very challenging uh, tasks where the vision community is interested in. And this, the reason for this success was that at this point in time, a lot of things came together. This, the availability of, availability of these huge data sets, these huge label data sets such as ImageNet, the availability of GPU, uh, GPU machines, GPU um, compute and uh, deeper neural and better neural network architectures. And this really was the spark, sparking point of the deep learning revolution. This is what many people point to, even though it's, it's not so, so black and white, but this is where, where people really widely recognize that this is something that is really, is going to really change the world. So here can, you can see uh, how the the arrow on this benchmark decreases. So there was a, it's not shown here, but before that, there was a kind of a stagnation of uh, this number around 25 to 30. But then there was a significant drop, like AlexNet was just significantly better than all its classical competitors in 2012. And then from there on, there was a continuous progress again, um, beyond human level performance for this particular special task. Now, from 2012 on, people realized that like big annotated data sets are really uh, one key to uh, solving this, this, uh, these complex challenges. And so there was a, a large number of data sets developed subsequently, such as what I show here is, is the Kitty data set that has been developed in my lab, but other data sets for various tasks like self-driving, image recognition, 3D deep learning, language understanding, um, vision and language modeling, uh, question answering or medical applications. However, creating real data is really expensive because you need to collect the data and you need to annotate the data. You need to hire people to say, well, this pixel is a tree. This pixel is a building. This pixel is a human, etc. And this led to the search of synthetic data sets. However, creating the content of synthetic data sets is also very costly, as you can see here. But interestingly, even very simple 3D data sets, very simple synthetic 3D data sets prove tremendously useful for training deep neural models. Uh, in particular, for instance, in the, in the case of optical flow for pre-training. So what you can do is you can create such a, 
a very simple data set. This is called flying chairs because it's just a bunch of CAD models that have been rendered in random orientation on top of random backgrounds. So it's very simple to generate if you have a collection of CAD models, which nowadays is also freely available um, on the internet. So if you use this quite unrealistic data set for pre-training your model, your model learns already some, some basic knowledge about the task, in this case, optical flow. And then you can use this model and fine tune it, adapt the parameters on a much smaller data set than previously uh, needed for the actual real task that you want to solve. And this also leads us to this success story of deep learning in terms of generalization. Deep neural networks are really good at, at generalization. And this is this may be accumulated in, in, in this uh, CVPR workshop paper here, where the authors showed this specifically. So here on the top, you can see a standard, like a pre-deep learning era image classification pipeline where the input is an image. And then there's this pipeline of you know extracting some features. Um, in a multi-stage process. A lot of hand engineering goes into this. And then in the end, a classifier like a support vector machine or a neural network or a random forest. Now, a CNN um, convolutional neural network bridges this directly. So it goes directly from the image to uh, the classification output, right? In this case, there is a last layer could be a SVM or last layer of a CNN, right? So it's not directly going to the classification output, but it's producing some features. But from there, there's just one more layer for classification. And what they have shown in this paper is that you can train the CNN representation on a very generic uh, uh, task like ImageNet classification. And then you just update um, the last layer, like the support vector machine, or a last layer of the neural network for a specific task on very little data and you get a competitive or performance that is competitive to the performance of classical techniques. And this was really surprising, right? So this meant that this, or this implied that learning this CNN based on uh, a, a very generic task produced very high level and abstract features that are extremely useful for a whole variety of tasks. So here you can see some of the tasks that they have considered. Object classification, bird subcategorization, human attribute detection, building retrieval, sculptor retrieval, image retrieval, etc. Completely different data sets. Yet the performance was even better than the classical techniques. They were specifically designed for these particular problems. So this was one of the, the the main insights into also for me like this was a was an eye opener. This was uh, opening the community's eyes and demonstrating that these models are really general. They work really well. In two thousand fourteen, um, Seiler and Fergus uh, published a paper on visualization of what these deep neural networks learn. The goal of this paper was to provide insights into what the network has actually learned because these networks are kind of black boxes. It's different from before where humans have hand engineered features. Now the entire model is a black box. So it's important to look at what the network learns. So they, what they did is they visualized image regions, as you can see here, that most strongly activate various neurons at different layers of the network. This is shown here for different neurons in different layers of the network. And they found that higher levels capture more abstract semantic information. You can see here the faces of dogs or wheels uh, or eyes, while at the lower layers, um, you can see basic gradient information. And then this led to, to some, some further insights into these models and, and also to better, to the design of better architectures and visualization of neural networks and understanding of neural networks is a very active research area still today. In 2014, it was also demonstrated, and this is kind of counterintuitive because I've just said these networks are very, gen like very robust and very uh, uh, expressive and they, are, they generalize very well. But in 2014, it has been demonstrated that, that at the same time, they can be also very easily fooled. 
using what they called adversarial examples. And this has developed in, into a, an own research area of its own. So what they've demonstrated in this paper um, is that accurate image classifiers can be very easily fooled by imperceptible changes to the image. So here you see the input image. Here you can see a, a very tiny, it's, it's magnified here just to see it, very tiny uh, noise pattern that's added to this image so that the image looks like this. It basically looks exactly the same as before to the human eye and the same for these other images. And while the classifier before was, was predicting the right class with high confidence, afterwards it put 99% of its confidence on the class ostrich for all of these images. So you can basically manipulate any image by adding this tiny uh, uh, imperceptible change, uh, delta x. So this is the objective here. You want to add this delta x. I want to find a delta x. That is, that is the smallest change, that's why it's an argument, the smallest change such that the class becomes different, right? Yeah. And so this was very surprising at the time. I still remember like, like at the conference uh, uh, being in the back of the, of the audience and, and looking at this, this presentation and uh, this, but this was, this was just, uh, this was just uh, astonishing for everybody that this was, was possible. Now, from 2014 on, um, things have started to develop extremely fast. So for instance, um, uh, and, and deep learning has dominated across a whole variety of, of, of tasks and research areas, not only in computer vision, but also in, in natural language processing um, and uh, medical and bioinformatics, etc. So in 2014, uh, for instance, there have been the first really successful deep models for machine translation, translating between languages. Um, and there have been also um, very compelling, uh, shocking results almost of deep generative models. Deep generative models are models that, and we'll look at these models in this lecture as well, um, that in an unsupervised fashion, tr uh, um, train a, a generative process, a generative model of a data set. So you give it a, a data set of images, you give it like thousands of images and it, it trains a generative process where given a random number you can go through this process and produce a novel image. And that image shows uh, something that's not in the data set that become, but that comes from the same distribution, that lives on the same manifold. It's an extremely challenging problem because the space, the, the image manifold is just extremely complex. Right? It's an extremely difficult task. But there was, in, in very few years, in only four years, an insane um, a progress on this problem. You can see like these first images that have been generated by this type of models were very coarse. But then over the years, you can see on the right the result of the style gun style generative adversarial network which produces these these all these little features of the hairs it's really hard uh, to imagine that there is a model that can produce even more realistic results than those which are almost hard to distinguish from um, a real photograph i have a little video for this here as well GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks, have captured the world's imagination with their ability to create AI-generated images of landscapes, animals, cars, and people without any human supervision. NVIDIA's Style GAN 2 features redesigned normalization and improved conditioning that delivers a new level of quality and creative control. For this demo, we used transfer learning and trained the model on an NVIDIA DGX system using a large data set of unique paintings. It can produce endless variations of AI-generated characters in a seemingly infinite variety of painting styles. With a prototype UI, we can fluidly create portraits by separately controlling the content, which is the identity, expression, and pose of a subject, and the artistic style, including the color palette, light quality, and brushstroke. Small fluctuations in details, such as hair and eyes, showcase StyleGAN's ability to create multiple coherent versions of the same image, similar to an artist creating variations on a theme using the same subject. 
we can explore different subjects for the portrait using a map of faces. Each is the result of a randomly generated input to the GAN. As we move around this map, the portrait subject smoothly blends between faces. Stopping between the long-haired girl and the man results in a subject whose appearance seems to lie halfway between the two. Notice that the painting style, the blue-gray background, and the light quality stay fixed as we navigate the subject map. The image grid on the left shows a style map. So, uh, while these models work very well on faces, uh, getting them to work on like a, a broader range of images, like what is, for instance, available in ImageNet with these 1,000 categories, is harder. But there is continuous progress towards this goal as well. Um, there have been also um, major breakthroughs in, uh, for instance, the prediction of molecular properties, for instance, for uh, generating novel materials using neural networks that operate on graph structures. Um, so that in summary, there, there, there have been like, like from 2014 on dramatic gains in, in vision and speech and related areas, which, which uh, was often referred to as the Moore's law of AI. Like every year we were kind of seeing AI, uh, the error rates become half of what the error rate has been the year before. In 2015, um, uh, DeepMind um, uh, demonstrated impressively that they could learn uh, policies. Policies are state action mapping, so an, what an agent sees and what it to what it does through random exploration and reward signals. This is something called reinforcement learning, and they demonstrated that you can also enrich reinforcement learning with deep neural networks if you do it cleverly and play uh, a variety of Atari games or learn to play a variety of Atari games, but while having never observed any human playing these games, just by trial and error. However, um, not all games have been equally easy and some, some games remained hard and are still hard today. In particular, games that require reasoning, that require remembering and thinking thinking long ahead. It's very difficult to, 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 to uh, devise the, uh, to devise the reward, like to put, to say where um, the reward signal should actually go into the weights of the neural network. It's called the credit assignment problem. In 2016, um, uh, Ort et al. had demonstrated that these deep neural networks are also extraordinarily good in producing uh, audio. So here's an example of speech generated with these models to mimic human voice. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. And here's an example of generated music. Another interesting work that I'd like to show you is style transfer. This is actually work that has been done here in Tübingen by Matthias Betke's lab. What they showed in style transfer, what they demonstrated is that these networks that are trained on data sets such as ImageNet are extremely powerful uh, or learn extremely powerful features that allow, for instance, to manipulate photographs um, by adapting the style of a different image. So here is an image of Tübingen, and this is a style image. And you can now produce an artistic version of this image. It looks like it has been drawn from a professional artist, um, but in this case, it's done using a neural network, combining these two. So it's really fun. There's an online app, you can try it yourself. In 2016, um, DeepMind has further demonstrated to master the game Go for the first time. This was like kind of one of the, the last uh, chess was already like mastered several years ago. So Go was a, a, a 
much more complex game where just brute force search that doesn't work anymore. So uh, what they demonstrated is that for the first time, a computer program was able to defeat a professional player. So you probably have heard about this AlphaGo um, computer that was able to beat uh, Lee Sedol in 2016. And then in 2017, DeepMind has produced a new version of this algorithm called Alpha Zero, which in contrast to the first one, didn't require to look at uh, professional gameplays, but learned entirely through self-play, play against itself. And at the same time was able to master not only Go, but multiple games. There have been similarly uh, important breakthroughs in the computer vision community. For instance, in recognition, this is just one of many examples called MARSC RCNN, which is a deep neural network for joint object detection and instance segmentation, which outputs a, um, a structured object. It outputs an entire pixel map, a label map, a set of bounding boxes for an image, not just a single class label, like in the ImageNet case. There was also major breakthroughs in um, uh, language models. And we'll see some of these language models in this lecture. In uh, 2017 and 2018, um, two very important papers, highly cited papers, Transformers and BERT were written. Transformers um, demonstrated that um, this classical uh, recurrence uh, neural in neural networks or convolutions in neural networks over time could be replaced by attention very effectively. And BERT demonstrated that uh, you can actually very effectively pre-train this model on huge amounts of unlabeled text, which is very easy to acquire on the internet. And, and then when, once you fine-tune these models, you get uh, state-of-the-art results on very challenging tasks, such as the GLUE benchmark. Um, so for instance, on the, on the first version of the GLUE benchmark, the algorithms have now achieved superhuman performance. This is a benchmark that um, tests uh, abilities of machines um, in the best way humans can imagine to test these abilities, such as paraphrasing, saying, well, is this sentence saying the same thing as this sentence? Or question answering, um, looking at a Wikipedia article and answering a question from that Wikipedia article. However, um, computers still fail in dialogue. So while these, these algorithms are very effective in solving these sp specific tasks, um, uh, as an expert, if you want to engage in a dialogue, it's very easy to make these systems fail. It's very easy to make the system not pass the Turing test. So this is in a sense, uh, maybe uh, it's a deficiency of these algorithms, but also a, a limitation of the benchmarks that we have today in truly benchmarking um, semantic understanding performance. Then in 2018, the Turing Award, which is considered the Nobel Prize of Computing, has been awarded to uh, like this, what is often called the founding fathers of deep learning, Joshua Benjo, uh, Jeff Hinton, and Jan Lecon, who have basically kept the research in deep learning alive over this, this entire period where not a lot of funding was uh, available for this type of research outside Canada. Then from 2016 on, um, in the computer vision domain, deep learning has, has mastered finally also more uh, difficult to master terrain, such as 3D deep learning, where it's hard to specify um, output representations that are easy to predict using neural networks. But then there were models coming along that could predict effectively voxel-based representations, point cloud meshes or implicit models, as you can see here. So these are, these are results in this case, this is one of our models here that you can see on the right, that are produced by just looking at a single 2D RGB image. So it's a, a 3D reconstruction predicted by looking at a single 2D RGB image, which is quite astonishing. And these models have been extended to all kinds of properties, not only geometry, but including also materials, light, or objects in motion. And then, uh, this year, in 2020, 
uh, GPT-3 came along, which is the first version of the language model of OpenAI, which is basically um, uh, upscaling the existing language models uh, to a gigantic number of 175 billion parameters using a tremendous amount of compute to train these models on uh, um, text repositories. And uh, what has so this has, has created a huge huge uh, um, impact uh, in the media um, because this was a model um, that was trained once but then could solve many different tasks. Uh, so it has many use cases. It can actually write compilable computer code. It can write poets that are hard to distinguish from real poets. It can write block or news articles or behave as a chatbot. So there have been some controversial discussions around this and uh, I encourage you to, to look them up. It has now uh, very recently licensed, uh, licensed exclusively to Microsoft. Yeah, so um, to conclude this part of this unit, um, we have seen a brief history of deep learning, but there are still some challenges for you that remain for the next generation that needs to address those. Um, for instance, uh, a lot of the, the big success that we've seen is on, in supervised learning, where you need a lot of annotated data, which is very expensive to create. So, so big trends now go back to what has al already been a big topic in the 80s, to, to unsupervised and self-supervised learning. Also, um, learning on static data sets is not enough. We as humans, we interact with objects. Like we take objects into our hands, we play around with them. So we learn through this interaction. And this is important to also, uh, to also uh, take into account. And that's why, for instance, um, this uh, you know, previously disjoint research communities, robotics and computer vision are kind of merging together now. Accuracy is another problem, right? While these models work super well in self-driving, you really need like a model that works extremely well. Right? Humans, uh, they um, produce a fatality every 100 million kilometers or so. In order to achieve this level of accuracy, you need an extremely good model, right? So it's like far beyond the accuracies that we achieve in image recognition, for instance. The models must be also um, more robust, right? I mean, uh, often deep learning models, they, they still work well on one domain where they have been trained for, but if there is very little data available for the, for the new domain there where they, they shall be applied, they fail. Um, and also robustness in terms of adversarial examples and understanding those from a, from, 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 from a mathematical perspective is very important. Um, it's also important to look at the inductive biases that these models have and the outcomes that are implied by these biases. Memory and compute is an issue. Like the large scale language models and vision models are trained on huge compute clusters, right? While our, the human brain only um, requires a few hundred watts. And there's of course a whole bunch of ethics and legal questions around this topic. And then maybe the question I, I want to leave you with for this, uh, this part of the unit is, well, will this Moore's law of AI continue? Over the last couple of years, we have seen it to, to hold, but um, it's not so clear if it will hold over the next couple of years. 